Excited to have my next guest on the show for the very first time. It's Neil Magny, who will be back in action at UFC Vegas 96, August the 24th, when he takes on Michael Morales. Neil, how are you? I'm doing great, man. How are you doing? I'm good. And I, and I want to start with just saying a, a happy birthday to you. I believe today <laughs> is number 27, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> oh, yeah, I wish. I had about another tender there. <laughs> yeah, it's my birthday. Uh, I'm turning uh, 37 today. Well, happy birthday. You're like a fine wine, man. And uh, it's it's interesting, too, because today is actually Tom Brady's birthday as well. My favorite football player of all time. And, you know, we've seen what he's done in his sport, the longevity that he has to you know play at such a high level into his mid 40s. I mean, you're still in the top 15. When, when you look at where you're at in your career right now and, and how you feel physically, how much longer do you have left to be competing at a high level? Um, realistically, I have to look at what some of the guys have done before. I look at guys like Glover Teixeira and that kind of thing. Um, Glover Teixeira was not only able to be competitive until he was well into his uh, early 40s, but um, also won a championship at 42. Um, so look, when I look at guys uh, in MMA for longevity, I'm not, I'm not just looking at the guys who are able to just show up to the fight and just kind of uh, have a coin. So I was like, maybe I win, maybe I lose, and you kind of go up there. Um, I look for the guys that are able to actually compete at the highest level. And uh, um, Glover Teixeira, Randy Couture, those guys are the actual examples for um, the guys that can actually be successful and very well competitive um, well into their 40s. So uh, for me, that's my standard. That's my um, – those are the guys that have done it before that let us know that it could be done, um, and they set the standard for me moving forward. Yeah, and I think you really showed a lot of people in your last fight, a uh, win over Mike Malott, that you still got it. I mean, you had, there's some difficulties early on, but you finished him late, and I kind of feel like you were getting disrespected a little bit leading into that fight because you were a massive underdog. What was your mindset going into that fight, and, and did you kind of have a chip on your shoulder? Um, at the end of it, uh, the Mike Malott fight was all about accountability. I mean, you look at my fight prior to that against uh, Ian Gary, I literally looked like someone's uncle walking off the couch going there fighting <laughs> Gary. Um, I was completely outclassed in that fight. So um, going into the Mike Malai fight, it was uh, it was just more so me taking accountability for my actions. I knew um, going into the Ian Gary fight that I didn't do the things leading up to that fight um, to go out there beat the best guys in the world. I had I relied on what uh, experience have taught me in the past as far as like, oh yeah, I took short notice fights before. I fought on seven days notice, three days notice, two days notice, and and was fine. But the difference between that fight and the fights prior was the work that was being done prior to the fight. Um, and I can honestly say the, the work being done prior to the Ian Gary fight was not what I needed to do to be the best guys in the world, and it showed. Um, so going into the Mike Malott fight, it was all about the preparation. It was all about the training. It was all about the mindset going into the fight. I mean, I bought, brought in the best training partners that could push me day in and day out. And they did just that. I mean, at, at one point during the uh, the training camp, the UFC film crew came in to um, film some of my training sessions or whatever. Um, and literally, they had a moment where they were like, uh, should we cut the camera? Neil's getting his ass handed to him right now. Um, I don't think it's going to make for good TV if he's just like getting beat over and over and over again. Um, but that's that's how I wanted the training to go. I wanted the training to be um, extremely difficult. I wanted the Osby stacked against me. I wanted to be able to still be able to rise to the occasion. So um, having training camp go the way, go the way that it did, having a fight go the way that it did, um, it was definitely something I prepared for and I trained for. So um, I wasn't surprised by the outcome at all. Looking back at the Malat fight, was there anything that that you would tweak? You know, when you when you look at the tape, anything you would have done differently? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's going to make it difficult moving forward finding these young guys, it's not even the um, the comparison in age, but it's more so the um, the comparison when it comes to the preparation for the fight itself. I mean, uh, Mike Malat is a guy when I, when we fought, he had about twelve fights or so. Most of those fights ending in the first round. So when it came to film study, I had literally about twenty minutes total of film study doing Mike Malat. So I had assumed that he would fight a certain way or come out a certain way um, based off the twenty minutes of film I had to watch for him. Where Mike Malat had literally almost 10 hours of UFC footage to do um, film study of me. I mean, th at this point, my opponents are going to know um, exactly when am I going to move forward, when am I going to move back, what are my tendencies, when am I going to breathe. Um, and so it's a lot easier for them to set a game plan for me than for me to set a game plan for them. But the, at the end of the day, um, a fight's a fight, and I'm going to find a way to get it done. You did absorb a lot of leg kicks. I feel like that was a game plan of his. How much did that affect your mobility in the fight? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's definitely one of the things moving forward where, um, I'm that th my train parties and or my not train parties, my opponents are going to go out there and they're going to try to throw those leg kicks over and over and over again. Um, uh, but it's something that, um, we see it in film. It's a, it's a blueprint that Lorenz Larkin threw out there and literally 
20 guys since then have uh, adapted to their game plan. So um, it's definitely something that's going to uh, be a factor that I have to consider going into the fights. But um, at the end of the day, I, to, I just have to expect it, be ready to defend it, and um, bring the fight to them. And that fight was eight months ago now. I, I can't believe how fast time moves, man. I swear, every year that goes by, it, it just goes faster than the last one. It's crazy. W what has life been like for you since? I mean, I know you're a proud father. You've got two kids. Has it just been, you know, spending time with them and, and in the training room getting better? Yeah, I mean, that's literally how it's been. I mean, uh, uh, um, this year has been great. I mean, um, there was a lot of... Uh, moving pieces at the end of the year, but I feel like we're finally starting to find our stride, finally starting to settle down, and um, life's been great. I've been able to uh, get a pretty constant training regimen going uh, where I'm able to focus on training for three, four, five hours a day at times, um, and then give literally all the rest of my time to uh, to the boys. So um, it, it's been really cool to be able to um, kind of start figuring out how life is going to look moving forward with uh, being able to prioritize being a dad and prioritize being an athlete as well. What are some of your hobbies and your kids' hobbies? I saw you made a post recently uh, doing some mini golf. Like, what are the, the things that you guys like to do? Man, it, it's, it's so cool because the boys are literally starting to pick up, like, on most of the habits that I – not the habits, but all the hobbies that I do. Like, even something as simple as, like, we're driving past the Home Depot, and both boys in the back are like, Home Depot, Home Depot, can we stop at Home Depot, Dad? I'm like – Huh, what three? What four year old and two year olds excited to go to Home Depot? But um, they're just kind of uh, following their dad around. They're watching me do certain things throughout the day, throughout the week, um, and they're really picking up on it. I mean, at the end of the day, um, the the hobbies are great, the the activities are great, but um, there's nothing more important to a child than actually spending time with them. So even if I'm with them, where I have to go do a task like pick up materials for a job site uh, at Home Depot or else maybe, um, just spending the time with the boys is what's most important, and you could definitely see um, through their reaction that that time is really paying off. This next question is kind of become like a theme in some of the interviews that I do just because my wife and I were, we're trying to to have our first child. Uh, you know, I've okay. talked to a lot of guys that, you know, have a couple of kids that are, that are younger and just, they talk about how much it's changed them and just like their mindset, like they wake up every day and they get after a little bit more. Can you kind of speak on that a little bit and, and maybe how much it's increased your discipline maybe? Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the biggest driver for me once having kids is the fact that, like, um, I absolutely have someone who depends on me now. I mean, prior to um, having my, my kids, I, I literally had a dog to care about. Like, my dog didn't care if I was gone for two hours a day, four hours a day, eight hours a day. It was just like, oh, I'm home. And they love their bit of it. But with my kids, it's not the same. I mean, I, I need to actually be there um, to spend that time with them. Um, in addition to that, like, uh, I, I can't let them down. They're relying on me. So when I go out there um, and I do something, I can't just go out there and go through the motions of it. I have to make it count. So if I had to leave home for five days, six days to go um, go compete or for a fight, I can't just go out there and just go through the motions of, of it. I have to go out there and make sure I'm really, literally doing my best and making that time away from them count. Um, and that's a huge driving factor for me to know that um, I can't take a moment for granted. I can't waste time away from them every single day time every single moment i'm spent away from them um should be something to actually better their life or better my time with them in the future yeah that's awesome man and you know prepping for this interview with you too i noticed that you know you were in the u.s army so you know thank you for your service how long ago was that now uh i got out of the army in 2013 so from 2006 to 2013 i did seven years in the army wow yeah that's that's amazing it, i wanted to get your thoughts on what happened uh, with Trump recently with the shooting and just your immediate reaction to that and, and just the, the craziness of kind of like the world we're living in. Yeah, as well. I mean, one, it's crazy that someone even put themselves in a position to actually want to take the shot at a former president that way. Um, two is just the, uh, the whole scenario. I mean, um, some people critique the uh, the secret service and the way they reacted towards that situation. Uh, but just from a tactical approach, I mean, this is this a situation where um, that was just way too close for comfort, regardless of what your um, political views may be. Uh, it's just way too close for comfort that uh, in a regular everyday joke can set up a uh, shop and take a shot at former president that way. Um, with the uh, technology that we have, with the secret service being in place and all these other um, government agencies that should be protecting our government officials, um, that situation is way too close to come for me regardless of uh um political views or affiliations yeah that was wild i, I still couldn't believe it when it happened uh, yeah. you know that, that gonna see is okay and, and you know what we'll see what happens moving forward i'm not gonna dive down sure. the political hole because that can get messy i'll just stick back to, to fighting here yeah, uh, back to fighting. <laughs> yeah, ufc uh 304 uh was last weekend what what a card that was um you know you got a new champion now Bilal muhammad beats leon edwards were you surprised by that did, did you think that Bilal could get it done 
No, not at all. I mean, it's funny because, uh, like, leading up to that fight, a lot of teammates and coaches asked, hey, what do you think about this fight? And they're like, oh, Bilal is going to out-wrestle him 100%. And people are like, oh, no, you're crazy. Yeah, no, can do this. Leonardo can do that. And it's just, it is stylistically, uh, Bilal Muhammad's wrestling abilities and, uh, um, excuse me, like they're up from Leon Edwards. It's just, it was just obvious what the game plan from uh, Bilal should have been. I mean, you watched the fight against Kamar Usman um, for four out of the five rounds. Kamar was just dominating with the grappling um, and then decided at one point to kind of like, all right, let me try striking for a bit, see if I can finish the fight on the feet. Uh, and unfortunately, he got caught in, the, in that first fight. Um, the second fight, I think he showed some hesitancy as far as wanting to overcommit to anything. Um, and that kind of showed as well. Um, but if you were to break down the two fighters and see what they do best, um, I feel like going into the fight, Bilal Muhammad's wrestling pedigree was what's going to carry him through the fight and allow him to be successful. And sure enough, it played out that way. Do you think he's going to hang on to this championship belt for a while, or is it going to change hands again soon? I honestly think we're in the era now with uh, with the UFC in general where we're going to see a lot of these belts start to change hands uh, uh, pretty frequently. I mean, uh, the the top of the divisions, whether it's uh, 185, 170, 155, um, a lot of these fights, the, these uh, divisions are super stacked and we're, we're past the era now where guys can pick and choose who their opponents are going to be. Uh, we're seeing a lot of fights now take place in the title fights where uh, we're getting true number one contenders that are fighting for the title. So um, in my personal opinion, I feel like the, uh, the belts are going to change hands a lot more frequently um, in these recent years than they have been uh, over the past couple of years. Who's the worst stylistic matchup for Bilal? Um, honestly, I think a guy who has some decent uh, wrestling defense and some, a pretty good striking offense would be uh, a, a good match for Bilal. I mean, I, I'll, I'll start at the end. Oh, myself. I want to be the guy to go out there and take him out. Uh, I think a Shavakat would be a very different fight for Bilal. Um, I think uh, a fight against Usman very different for Bilal just because of the uh, um, the wrestling kind of casting each other out there. Um, Kobe, I think, would can, kind of be – I think Bilal might be an edge of that one now. But, I mean, I think that there was a lot of very difficult fights for Bilal at uh, 170, especially at the top of the division right now. Uh, Sean Brady, I know the first fight uh, between Sean Brady and Bilal Muhammad, it ended up with – the world being shocked that Bilal was able to yeah. uh, finish Sean Brady. But I think with, in the rematch in that fight, I think Sean Brady gets the best of him in that fight as well. Yeah, well, the welterweight division is, is so deep. There's so many great you know competitors outside of the top 15 too. So you, you guys have a, a, a basically just so many fighters that are here nowadays that, that can compete uh, at a very high level. Um, I'm a huge fan of, of Curtis Blades. I always have been. Tom Aspinall is scary, man. Like I, I, I feel like he's someone that, maybe potentially could get the better of John Jones. Am I crazy by saying that? Like how good is Tom Aspinall? And were you surprised uh, what, what he did against Curtis? Um, I was definitely surprised. I mean, Curtis being a friend of mine, training partner yeah. of mine, I was definitely surprised and bummed out for the outcome of that fight. Um, and it's, uh, I don't want to take anything away from Aspinall, but like, uh, it, it's just one of those things like, man, I didn't see that fight going out that way. Um, one decision from either fighter changed the outcome of that fight. I mean, they were just so um, closely matched. I mean, it was literally uh, just Aspinall did one thing well where he was able to uh, drop Curtis initially. Um, Curtis decided to get back to his feet immediately and turn his back slightly. Um, and Aspinall took advantage of it. I mean, um, congrats to him. He, he executed well, but like, uh, I think these fights are so close. I mean, much so like uh, we're discussing the welterweight division. Um, I think these fights are so close that it comes down to who's able to make the least amount of mistakes as a person that's come out um, successful at the end of it. And unfortunately for Curtis that night, he's the guy that made uh, a few mistakes that Aston was able to capitalize on. But um, in my opinion, my mind, I think John Jones is going to be a very difficult fight for Aston with John Jones' fight IQ um, and the way that John Jones fights. Uh, he takes very little risk. He makes very few mistakes. He doesn't put himself out there to really get um, uh, countered or, or or blasted the way that Aspinall has been able to blow through some of his opponents in recent. Was the Blades Aspinall finish too soon? Um, I mean, you could argue that it's too soon, but at the same time, uh, uh, it was just a difficult place to find yourself. I and mean, when you're face down eating shots, it's uh, it's very difficult to argue against the decision that the ref is able to make. I mean, me personally, I would love to give my friend every opportunity possible to uh, get back to his feet and uh, turn the tide, so to speak. But um, at the end of the day, the, the ref had his job to do, and he did it to the best of his ability, the best of his knowledge, based on what um, he saw at the moment. It would pretty, be pretty difficult to argue that uh, after the fact. Have you talked to Curtis afterwards? Like, how's he doing? 
Um, very briefly. I mean, he just messaged me today for my birthday, that kind of thing. Uh, he's still out in uh in the UK, enjoying some time uh off and that kind of thing. So, uh, he's definitely in good spirits, doing well. Um, from what I can tell. Um, so I'm just excited for him to get back, keep moving forward, and uh, get his opportunity to fight for the title again. Yeah, no doubt, man. Um, so just to to be clear, uh, based on what you were saying, if Aspinall does fight John Jones, you you're picking John Jones. Oh, 100%. I mean, John Jones' fight IQ, his fight ability, um, the way he moves around the cage and uh, how very few mistakes he makes in in, in his fights, uh, I 100% will go with John Jones in that fight for sure. What about Poetan if he fights either one of those guys? That's the uh, that's what has been more difficult because I uh, when you say John Jones versus uh, Pereira. Yeah, per Pereira versus Jones or Aspinall, either Pereira's one. Not. The Arsenal fight, I think uh, Pereira could give Arsenal a little more difficulty um, just because you have to respect his power. Um, he's not a guy you just go like, oh, yeah, just take him down and beat him there. It will be a very difficult task to get past that range and actually be able to um, connect with him. So I think uh, excuse me, the Arsenal fight might be not, not an easier fight that he's like less competitive. But like, uh, I think between the two, um, if he were to win the fight, I think he'd have a better chance against uh, Arsenal than he would against John Jones. Um, John Jones just has so many ways to to win the fight. I mean, he can outpoint him from the outside. He can beat him in the clinch. He can beat him on the ground. He can actually beat him with the uh, power. So um, I think in the fight against John Jones, he just has more ways of winning um, than anyone else in the top of the division right now. Um, I could be biased in that opinion, but uh, uh, I, that's the different how I would see it. Isn't it crazy just the the fast rise of of uh, Pereira? I mean, he hasn't even had that many fights as a pro, and here he is being considered as like one of the best ever. Like, are you just surprised at just how quickly he came into the UFC and is dominating? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, uh, I'm different one of those guys that's kind of skeptical to jump on the quote unquote hype train at times, but um, this dude has backed it up every single time. And then uh, for me, it's even cooler just to see how well a good camp around you can help you be successful. I mean, uh, what him and Glover to share have going on is something that's truly special. Um, and we see that uh, coach athlete relationship take place. Um, I think great things can happen and he's shown it time and time again. I mean, um, the way that those two have bonded over years and what they've been able to get done in the last four years of his uh, UFC run, uh, it's been great. It's been incredible. I gotta tell you a, a quick little story. You could tell me if if you were in my shoes, if you'd be embarrassed. But so I've got to interview Glover a, a, a handful of times, and I, I love talking to him. Before Pereira ever made his UFC debut, uh, I was before the interview started. I was getting ready to, to talk with Glover. Uh, Poetan comes in, and, and Glover's like, "Hey, Poetan," you know, and he's introducing him and everything. And I didn't realize who it was until afterwards. And I was like, "Oh my God, that's that's Pereira, the guy that beat Adesanya in kickboxing." Like. It, that made me feel so silly for someone that follows combat sports, but it just goes to show you like the difference of fighting outside of the UFC. And then once you make it in the UFC, how much of like a global star you are, right? Like, would you agree yeah, with that? I, mean, I definitely follow some boxers, some kickboxers uh, and other guys in other sports, other organizations, that kind of thing. But uh, with this point now, that there's so much content out there when it comes to combat sports. I mean, um, there's not a weekend that goes by. There's not at least one major uh, combat sport event, whether it's kickboxing, uh, MMA or uh, boxing. There's just so much uh, content out there when it comes to uh, being able to like just, just follow it all. That makes it like. For me, being a fan of the sport, not even to like uh, be a media person on that, I think it's different for me to keep keep up with it all. So I can only imagine what it's like when you're having to like follow all these different yeah. sports in order to be able to give your uh, your professional view and, and analytic, analytical view on it all, on it all. How much it is for you so uh, that's not embarrassing at all it's a okay it's a lot of content out there to keep up with for sure well thank you especially i'm still doing this part-time you know i got a great full-time job so it's difficult to keep <laughs> up with everything man let's let's transition to your fight with morales i'm really excited about this one again ufc vegas 96 august the 24th you're you're at the apex uh this is another young up-and-comer someone that's hungry undefeated record 16 and 0 how how would you compare his style and what he brings to the table versus maybe some other opponents that you've fought in the past? Is this guy as as difficult of a puzzle to figure out? Um, definitely. I mean, is uh, I mean, like like I was saying earlier with the Mike Milad fight. I mean, not only these guys are difficult puzzle to figure out. I mean, it's easy if you ever purchased a puzzle from the store. It's easy to buy a puzzle and have that picture on the box that tells you what the puzzle should look like. Um, when these guys are undefeated and don't have many fights, um, uh, it's like buying that puzzle and not having that box to put it together. You're kind of trying to figure it out on the fly as far as like where what piece goes where and that kind of thing. So you start with the the outer edges that kind of give you an idea of how the puzzle should go. Then you start working away with the, with the similar colors and figure and group those together. Um, so when it comes with uh, fighting an undefeated guy without much uh, 
octagon footage and that kind of stuff. Um, it definitely makes it more difficult to be able to assess them going into the fight and figure out like um, what the game plan should be um, to beat that person. So uh, to a certain extent, you kind of have to like adjust on the fly. So uh, in training now, um, I'm having guys with similar um, styles of my opponent that are coming in to uh, uh, help me prepare for them. But I'm also switching it up mid-round. So I'm having three different guys with similar styles but do everything um, different where the expectation for me should be the same, but what they offer is slightly different. So um, on the fly, I'm having to figure out that that puzzle in training. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going to take to the fight with me where um, I could expect that fight to go one way based off what we saw on film. And then on fight night, because of the nine hours of film watching on me, he's performing a completely different way um so for me it's just preparing for all the uh the unknowns that can present itself on fight night and just being ready for it who are those training partners specifically uh so we got a lot of young guys on there uh, we have uh ben he's uh he's up coming from uh, alaska uh he's seven and one now just fought for lfa recently has a huge fight coming up we have lance Wright. um i have ryan charlaboy who's in there as well um yeah, so many guys to name um <laughs> I'm going to forget somebody. You have Jarrell Askew. Um, we have a lot of different guys on the team that's been really pushing forward for this fight. Um, and like I said, it, it's been cool to have guys that have similar striking abilities to what my opponent has, but also give me different puzzles to figure out on the fly as well. Yeah. And Neil, you're 22 and 10 in the UFC. Morales is is only 4 and 0. So the experience difference is, is vast here. How much, <laughs> how much of a factor is that going to play in, in this fight? Um, so I, what I learned in the, uh, Ian Gary fight is the, what you do in the weeks thing outside fight, what matters most. I mean, um, on paper, sure. My 30 plus fights in UFC should be, uh, enough to like, give me some kind of advantage. But, um, if I'm not putting in the work, uh, in the weeks prior, all that means absolutely nothing. So, um, the preparation, the things that I'm putting myself through over the next couple of weeks or having for myself through the last couple of weeks, um, is what I think is to give me the confidence to go out there and get the job done come August 24th. Um, and that's what I'm heavily relying on. I'm making sure I'm going through, um, every single scenario, every, every worst case scenario, be able to prepare for this fight, uh, bring out the best version of myself. If this fight does take place on the feet, how worried are you about his power? Oh, I'm not too worried at all. I mean, I, I fought the best investment at this point on the feet. I mean, uh, um, I don't think there's many people that hit harder than Hector Lombard uh, I'm at 170. I mean, uh, being able to take punches from a guy like that and still stay standing. Oh, well, still end up standing, I should say. I didn't stay standing. <laughs> but still end up standing and taking shots from Hector Lombard. I mean, I um, think that speaks for itself. So um, when it comes to just the power, I'm not too worried about it at all. Um, it's just everything that the, the fight entails that I have to be uh, on my toes and, and, and prepared for. Yeah, and and I know you've heard this this term before, but when I look at the opponents that you're getting now, I mean Mike Millot, now Michael Morales, uh, the, the the gatekeeper word uh, it comes into discussion. I know I know you've heard it. I mean, does that does that tick you off when you hear that kind of stuff? And do you feel like that's what the UFC is kind of using you as? Um, at the end of the day, I mean, like, like I started interview saying, it's uh, it's my own accountability. I mean, if I go out there um, and I don't perform the best of my ability and I give up these fights to give these opportunities, um, then I fall into that role of being a gatekeeper. Uh, if I go out there and I beat these young upcoming couple guys and I keep doing it over and over and over again, um, start getting more ranked opponents and moving out the rankings, that kind of thing, um, I go from being gatekeeper to being contender to being champion. So uh, for me, it's all about accountability. I don't look at it as like uh, um, the UFC's uh, look at me as a gatekeeper or they're disrespecting or anything, anything else like that. Um, I just see the the task at hand. Um, and I need to go out there and get it done. So um, if I don't meet the task, I fall into being a gatekeeper. If I go out there and I um, meet the task or su su suppress the oh, not suppress or surpass the uh, um, the standard, um, now I'm in a position to be a contender again. So for me, uh, I don't take it as being a quote unquote disrespectful thing or um, how the UC is quote unquote using me. It's more so like. I have an opportunity to go out there and show that I'm still able to be one of the best guys in the world. Um, go out there and get it done. Do you have an official prediction? Um, I'm guaranteeing that I'm going to go out there and get a TKO finish either late in the second round or early in the third round. I love it. And, and do you pay attention to the the odds? Like, I know you guys aren't able to, to bet. You're official UFC fighter. You, you can't do that, right? But do you go and do you look at that stuff? Um, I have before, I mean, and at times it's like it's just hard to escape it. I mean, um, people are tagging you and uh, all types of crazy stuff on social media. Like people are coming up and say, "Hey, man, I'm betting the house and you're an underdog. Get it done." So it, it's almost impossible not to uh, uh, come across the odds. So you definitely um, do hear it at times, do see it at times. Um, there there are times that like like anything else, you give it more um, power than it need be. Where um, there's been fights where 
excuse me. Um, I was a significant underdog, and the, the fight played out that way. There's other dog fights where I've been a significant underdog, and I went out there and won the fight. So um, for me, it's, it, it just all draws back to accountability. Whether I'm an underdog or a favorite, I still have to go out there and get the job done. I mean, I can remember talking to Austin Hubbard at one point where um, there was a period where uh, I was – an underdog for a majority of my fights. And I went out there and I won those fights. Um, and I'm sitting there kind of bragging to Austin Hubbard about it. Like, yeah, man, every time I'm the underdog, I go out there and I win the fight. And he, without skimming the beat, says like, yeah, but every fight you're supposed to win, you lose. So what's the point? And I'm just like, damn, dude, that's a good point. Um, so for me now, um, I don't pay attention to the odds at all. I mean, I, it's impossible to escape them. I'm going to see the odds at one point or another. Uh, so for me, it's all about going out there and getting the job done. How many fights do you have left on your, your current deal? Uh, I just had a new four fight contract. So we're we're re upping and we we got four more to go out there and uh um get the job done, continue climbing the ranks, continue getting things done and, and keep moving forward. That's wonderful. So this is your first fight on the new deal? Yep, first fight of four in my new uh UFC, UFC contract. Good for you, man. Congrats. You happy with the money? Yeah, I'm happy with definitely thrilled with it. I mean, uh we invested a lot of real estate for my family and I uh after this fight. So I'm definitely thrilled about it. Okay, that's fantastic, man. Before we get you out of here, I, I want you to play matchmaker for me. Pretend that the UFC, Sean Shelby, McMahon, they call you up and they want you to be the uh, the welterweight matchmaker. How, how would you match the top of the division right now? Like, who would you match with Bilal? Like, if they're, if if we could take, like, the top six right now or top eight or however you want to do it and you match them up to, to make a tournament, tell, run me through how, how you would do that. I'll have to do it today. I would definitely put Bilal versus Shavkat immediately. Um, I'd put Leon Edwards uh, versus a guy like uh, Ian Gary. Um, I'd put Kamaru. Uh, in, in a perfect world, I'd put Kamaru against Brady instead of Kamaru, instead of Brady against uh, Burns. Uh, I'd put Burns against Buckley. Um, let's see how far back we go. Thompson, I would think I would put him against someone uh, who's kind of young and upcoming as well. Just kind of like put him in a position where it's kind of like, hey, man, either uh, – go or get out the pot, so to speak. Uh, so I put him against a, uh, one of the guys that are like either in the top 15 or knocking the door of the top 15 just to kind of um, keep things moving. And then uh, from there, let's see how, they, how it all plays out. Who would win uh, if Leon fought Ian Gary? Um, If I, and again, it's probably going to sound pretty biased, but um, if I were to choose the winner in that fight, I would have to say it will probably be Ian Gary just based off of uh, – of movement and volume uh, is one of the things that uh, Leon has struggled with in, in past fights. Just the um, the volume that guys are able to put on him, it tends to be where he uh, makes most of his mistakes. I mean, uh, we had to fight against uh, Nate Diaz. Nate Diaz was uh, just out there just pressuring him and eventually was able to even hurt him to the point of like, oh, wait, maybe I can uh, turn the tide, so to speak. So uh, he definitely struggles with the, with the volume, whether it's through offensive striking or offensive wrestling. Um, so definitely kind of tipped the scale to Ian Gary in that fight. And he's obviously had a lot of, uh, I guess, flack and negative publicity, you could say, right, to say the least. What What were your thoughts of, you know, just him as a, as a person and the interactions that you had with him? Um, to be honest, I thought at that moment he was uh he was a prick. I mean, he's this yeah, uh, <laughs> young arrogant prick for for the things he was saying, the way he went about it. But um, at the same time, I put myself in a position to um have some of those things out there for him to be able to um say or even even do kind of thing. So um, it, it was my fault for even throwing things out there for him to be able to say that way. But um, I think these last few months or ever since the last year, I want to say um, it's been definitely a humbling experience for him. Uh, and it has been cool to see his growth as an individual uh, based off of that. I mean, I don't think he's a guy that uh, was going to come out and say, Hey, I, I was wrong for speaking on things the way I spoke on it. Let's uh, leave it in the past and move on. But um, I can definitely tell through his current interviews and his mannerism that like uh, um, the experience that he had since the, he and I fought have definitely been uh, humbling for him and he's he's going for it so um for any fighter that's kind of what you would want at the end of the day do you think he'll ever win the title um i think has good odds of uh of doing it um i mean he's definitely uh he definitely has the skill set for doing he definitely surrounds himself with good people to be able to uh get things done i mean um his last fight he had guys like db my in his corner and that kind of thing so um he's definitely a guy who's um eager to improve and willing to improve and willing to do what it takes to improve so um with the dose of humility i think he definitely could go a long way and actually get it done one other guy I just want to get your thoughts on real quick is Jack Della Maddalena. How good is he? Uh, what, what do you feel like, you know, his ceiling is? 
Yeah, I mean, he's definitely good. I, that's one of the guys I forgot when we were going over the matchups. He's definitely one of those guys that kind of like slid under the gate, so to speak, uh, when it comes to uh, some of the guys in the top division. He, he came in, he had a couple of fights. Uh, he is now ranked in the top five, top six of the division. Uh, he's definitely one of those guys that kind of like skated right in there uh, and stuck his way to the top. I mean, I can say he's stuck his way to the top. He earned his way to the top for sure. Uh, but he's definitely another talented up and coming dude. I, mean, I think he's 27 years old or so. Um, he's a solid boxer out of Australia. So uh, he's definitely a difficult matchup for everybody. I mean, um, with his fight against um, uh, Basil, you can definitely tell that he's actually more well rounded too. I mean, you look at him thinking, oh, cool. This guy's a boxer. He's a striker. This is how you beat him. But um, how he had himself in a fight against uh, Basil definitely shows that he's actually knows his way around the cage as far as like uh, being able to wrestle, being able to grapple and that kind of thing as well. So um, I think he's definitely a, a total package kind of guy and he definitely has the ability of making a, a good run in the UFC as well. Yeah. Again, the welterweight division, there's so many great fighters excited to see all the matchups that, that do happen here in the future. Neil, I, I just want to thank you again for taking uh, time to talk to me today, especially on your birthday. So happy birthday again, before we do officially sign off, I, I want to give you the floor. If there's uh, anything you want to plug uh, or anyone you want to thank the floor is yours. Oh man, if you guys could just go check out uh, Nate Marquardt's uh, Instagram page. I mean, he moved his family over to Asia. Uh, he built a school there. He built a martial arts academy there. And he's doing a lot of great things over in Asia. So if you guys can check out Nate Marquardt's uh, Instagram page and see what he's doing over in Asia, um, and support him in any way that you guys can, that would be great.